generally one would consider bushmeat as any wild animal meat so long as the animal is not a domesticated animal. This meat, whether smoked, boiled, dried, whatever, we consider it as bush meat. Bush meat plays a tremendous role in the life of Ghanaians. Protein wise, it's a very important source of food. When fish were in good supply, they tended to be cheap, and people bought huge amounts of fish with relatively small demand for bush meat. When fish became more scarce, it became more expensive and people overwhelmingly turned towards bushmeat, which, of course, probably fueled you know, more hunting uh, because there was that demand. One of the biggest obstacles is far from Africa. European governments subsidize factory fishing fleets to work distant waters. Without such incentives, fishers could not afford to work so far from home. And piracy also contributes to the problem. Up to 20% of the world's catch is hauled in by thieves. And most African nations are too poor to put up a fight. Hordes of fish would appear, dying on the shore. I remember days that we went to the beaches and there was like tons of fish washed out on the beaches. Every conceivable type of fish came out by the tons and tons and tons. A lot of fish were still alive. We never knew there was so much fish in the sea. And now so much dead fish. It was a shocking spectacle. Curry knew just by using her nose that during an event, the sea bubbled with hydrogen sulfide, a toxic gas. But where was it coming from? Curry thinks small marine organisms called phytoplankton are the culprits. The water here is thick with them. After phytoplankton die, they rain down on the sea floor and decay. And decay often makes hydrogen sulfide. In principle, the gas could be building up, becoming a kind of ticking time bomb. The discovery of large methane buildups was a critical break in the case. Curry thinks a violent eruption of methane could also release the trapped hydrogen sulfide. As the hydrogen sulfide reacts with the oxygen and water, sulfur is set free. This is what changes the color of the sea. The hydrogen sulfide would also first paralyze, then suffocate fish. It's an atmospheric storm coming over the ocean. That would lower the pressure on the surface of the water. According to Bakken, as pressure falls on the surface, it will drop on the seafloor as well. Lower pressure uncorks the methane, which in turn releases the hydrogen sulfide. As the bubbles rise, they expand. And this further reduces pressure on the bottom, ultimately triggering an eruption which spreads in all directions. A growing global movement is trying to rebuild wild stocks and give fish a break by setting aside patches of ocean as no fishing zones. In Baja, California, strict new regulations on the size, sex, and timing of lobsters caught is making for a better harvest. And similar measures are helping North Pacific halibut and Bristol Bay sockeye salmon. O'Hanlon sees one future, and it's called the aquapod.
This space age sphere will enable O'Hanlon to boldly go where few have gone before, to farm the open ocean. O'Hanlon believes open ocean farming will dramatically increase production to meet rising demand. And it could do so with less harm to the environment than coastal farming for one simple reason. We have very strong, consistent, steady currents. We never see the same water twice based on our current patterns. And the currents are so strong that it basically flushes the site. It translates into approximately 680 million gallons of water a day flowing through each cage. Today, aquaculture isn't perfect. Many problems remain to be solved. Shrimp farms have led to widespread destruction of mangroves. Lethal viruses can spread to the wild. Penned fish can escape and breed with wild animals. But as long as farmers like O'Hanlon continue to recognize and confront problems, the industry can evolve and improve. And as O'Hanlon sees it, a lot rides on efforts like his. What happens if aquaculture does not develop? We end up starving people all over the world. I think it's absolutely critical that aquaculture develops and that it develops sustainably. It used to be that nearly everyone with a rod and reel had a story about the big one that got away. Today, fishers are telling another kind of tale. A bounty thought to be inexhaustible turns out to be vulnerable. As life in the ocean is depleted, the effort it takes to catch any fish is going nowhere but up. And the decline of stocks has revealed the once invisible ties that bind all life to the sea. Can we ignore these connections? When we protect fish, we protect our home and ourselves. I think the whole care everything is something that we should look into, but I don't think that we should waste too much time or too much I don't think people are that concerned about what goes on in the Arctic. People are basically interested in themselves and their families and surviving. Uh, I don't view it as a big problem. I think it's something that we can definitely deal with and possibly solve, yes. I really haven't thought about it because it's been very cold lately, so, you know. I certainly wouldn't want somebody to tell me that I can only drive every other day or I can not use my aerosol. As long as we're still that. relying upon electricity and cars and things like that, we're not going to get away from that. I don't know what I can do to change the situation because it's such a, a global problem. This energy ripples through the atmosphere like a wave in a pool. When it reaches the North Atlantic, it reinforces the energy of the North Atlantic Oscillation, producing the pattern we've seen in recent decades and driving more African dust to the Americas. The warming of the Indian Ocean. And then how that affects the North Atlantic Oscillation. And that affects how the dust gets mobilized in the Sahara then you get a lot of dust in the air getting blown over to the Caribbean.